paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Paranormal Karen. Funny too. Paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, and did I mention she's funny too? Yeah. Cha cha cha. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Paranormal Karen. I am, uh, I had a nice time off. I'm still sort of in it when I'm taping this because, you know, I tape way ahead. Um, but this is going to be an episode about the boss and how magical, uh, my life is. Now, I want to say this quickly. If you are a new listener to Paranormal Karen, this is not the episode to start with. This is one that is kind of for people that listen to the show and know my life and know about courage, my dog and the boss. So if you're new, I don't want to discourage you. Um, Check out some other episodes. This one will be paranormally, but not, uh, I don't like my podcast to be too much about me. And this one's probably going to be all about me. So folks, if you're new, go back a week, listen to whoever was before this, <laughs> because I have the best guests. So today I'm just going to sort of reset and let you guys know what happened with the boss. Also a couple of things. I'm really trying to sort of shift my workload. I'm doing a ton of readings and um, I have my Patreon and my Patreon is not, it's all tarot and psychic development. I'm very proud of it, but I know some of you guys aren't about that. I did put a tier that is just a $5 tier and kind of um, you guys will get uh, the psychic stand-up shows as I get them, which is not frequent, but I just thought, you know what, maybe I'll just put up a $5 tier. If you like the podcast and you're like, yeah, I can kick in $5 a week. That's all it is. And <laughs> so basically I'm saying there's a tier where you can give me $5 a month and get nothing. Um, you will get access to the, uh, psychic stand-up shows as they come out and the new CD. I'll probably just give you guys that online. Um, and you know what? If you don't have $5, please enjoy the podcast. I am not doing this for money. I'm just trying to shift things. And I thought, well, throw that out there. Um, and it already sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> so uh, whatever. I love you guys. You guys have been so great during this. So the first part of what I'm telling you today, I, um, so I moved to Utica, New York. I was going to move to Tennessee. I was going to do comedy there, but I, my sister, um, I, I think we crossed the line with my parents and where it was sort of easy to watch over them and stuff like that. It's not easy now and they're getting very forgetful. So I did not want to move to Utica, New York. But I will tell you, synchronicities and everything told me you are going and it is going to be fine. And that is absolutely true. Um, driving here cross country, I don't know if I'll do that again, but it was, it started out really fun. And then all of a sudden I hit a snowstorm in Tulsa, but of course I found a hotel that was right down the street from the discount tire store. So I could get the all weather tires that you don't get in California. And then my windshield wiper fluid kept freezing. And then I found the right fix for that. So this whole trip, which started with, um, I left my place in Los Angeles, did a gig in Santa Maria, kept stopping, said I was only going to do five to seven hours. Cause I don't like to drive that much. Um, all the hotels got shifted. It all worked out even to the point where hotels.com, where they don't let you cancel. We're like, sure, cancel whatever you need. Um, so I am here trying to get comedy started. If you're any of my comedy friends out in the East Coast, let me know any clubs or whatever. I'm knocking on all the doors. And hopefully right down the street from where I live, there is this fantastic theater called the Uptown Comedy the or the Uptown Theater. I had done stand-up there before. I came back. The guy is great. So I think I'm going to be getting that psychic stand-up show up there. So it'll have clips. Hopefully you guys on the five dollar level will get to see a whole show. I'll put the video up the whole thing. Um, so I'll remind you of that when it happens. Um, so kind of just making my own way and stumbling through, I will say this, these are the nicest people in the world out here. I, there's nice people everywhere, but the comics here are great. All this is going on. Okay. So I'm blathering on. 
So um, that's where I am still doing readings. Please book a reading if you like. Uh, KarenRontowski.com. Uh, like I said, the um, Patreon, the $3 level, you level, you get the card of the day, five days a week, uh, and you get four classes. For $10, you only get the four classes because some people, I think that was too many emails. So you got the $10 level where you just get the four classes every month. And then at $15, you get everything. And then at $5, you get nothing. <laughs> I'm a genius. Uh, there you go. So all of that, and um, I should have a new CD coming out. So, so I want to tell you all about the boss, and then I believe next week I will be having Sonia King on. Um, we'll see how this episode goes. If this episode's only forty minutes, I'm going to have her do the last twenty minutes with me. But I'd like to give her a whole hour um, because she, of course, was with me the whole time. So you guys know I always talk about the boss. He is. Um, I believe he's my twin soul. Um, I know, you know, Jessa and I had talked about it and she knows somebody with a horse named Sassy, a beautiful horse that that might be that person's, uh, twin soul, twin flame. Um, and I'm probably going to be pausing this a lot so that, cause some of it gets pretty heavy, but it's such a beautiful story. Hang with me. It's going to be more beautiful than sad. Okay. I just paused it and then took 10 minutes to figure out how to resume, which I already knew how to do. So I have been a little scattered. This has been quite, uh, it was about a month before I left. Um, I left California and it was about a month of just trying to get rid of everything because I literally drove cross country with only what fit in my car. I mailed a couple of boxes to my sister so that I'd have some stuff when I get here, but my little car, little blue, uh, you know, hippie pippy, you, uh, you did that great reading on me and told me about little blue. Um, God bless my 2009 Versa. It's made it like a champ. Okay. So, but before I was leaving just to get rid of, I lived in that apartment 10 years just to get rid of everything was such a massive chore and, uh, to have the gigs throughout was great. So courage started, um, not eating well. It was so tense. Everything was kind of weird, um, about that month, but I figured most of it was stress. Now, for those of you who don't know, there has not been anything less than magic since I got courage. Um, 18 years ago, I decided I actually went and auditioned for the Letterman show and I have been, I was on the Letterman show, but it literally took five years to get on. Like people think you audition, you get on. No, some shows do that. Took five years to get on because the producers didn't think I was ready. And thank God for a guy named Eddie Brill that just kept pitching for me. And that show, uh, they said no. And I was so upset. And I said, I'm getting a dog. Um, so I went to the pound in Los Angeles where I was living. And I didn't even know anything about this. I, I just was like, oh. And I walked up and I saw this tiny little nose. Uh, courage was three pounds. He was six months old, little tiny nose under the fence. And I was like, what's that? And I started scratching his head and I asked the guy how much for that dog. And he said, Oh, that dog goes on auction, uh, Sunday afternoon. And he's going to go probably a couple thousand. Everybody wants the small dogs. He's going to go a couple thousand. So I was like, okay, I, I, whatever. And I left. And then I kept thinking and I went back and I, I said, I got to look at that dog a second time. That dog is so perfect and the cutest dog I've ever seen. So I go back and, um, I'm just scratching under his chin and he's just been taken from his mom. He, I, the other dogs are pushing him out of the food bowl. He is just not, you know, crying the whole time. And so I said, uh, to the lady, I go, that, that dog goes on auction noon Sunday. And she goes, no, I don't know why that guy's telling people that it goes on auction at 11 on Sunday. So I thought, Oh, okay. So I thought, well, I'm not going to get him show up. I go just Sunday morning. I go, I gotta go. I'm going to give it a shot. So I show up at 11. There's only three of us. Um, the bidding starts at, I think a hundred dollars. Somehow it gets up to 200. The first guy drops out. Okay. So then it's me and this woman that has kids that are kicking the soda machine and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, Oh my God, you should never have a small dog. 
and she bids 500 and I we get up to 500 and I say 550 and she slams down her purse and walks out. So he's mine. So the lady runs my credit card and as she's running my credit card, the door opens behind me and there's about a hundred people in line screaming. I was told that dog went on auction at noon. And all I remember was this one uh, woman that had the purse ready as though she was going to put the dog in it today. So that was the first magical story of how I got courage and courage. Um, I got to hold him that day, but then they had to get him fixed and they had to do some other stuff. And I'll never remember, I'll never forget them calling me and going, so we have to get him uh, spayed or neutered or whatever happens to a dog. I don't know. I don't even know. So they go, do you want us to give him a shot for the pain? And I was like, yes. And they were like, it's extra $50. And I was like, yes. Um, why would you ever not give that shot? Who says no to that? So they did that. And then I remember the day I went to pick him up. He was so small. He sat on the palm of my hand. He was so adorable. So this is love at first sight. This is, um, the first night I wanted to crate train him. So he cried in the crate for about two hours until I finally picked him up and put him under my chin and he slept there like a baby. So that was the beginning. And a lot of people know courage had a service, which was when I choked, he would wake me up at night. And that's why, and where this started, um, where I started taking him on the road and taking him everywhere with me. So, um, jump ahead. This is my guy. I hope this isn't boring you guys, but this is all about the boss. Um, and I think he deserves an episode. Don't worry. My fantastic guests are going to be along next week. So, um, so he's my guy. We end up moving, I think three times and, um, he just owns everyone wherever the boss goes, he owns it. And if you saw his picture, he is the most beautiful dog. He just was so beautiful. People loved him. He brought sunshine wherever he still has fans. Um, and at that point he was so small and never forget we were in the airport in Dallas and these little girls are petting him and he's having a ball. And then he just jumps up and chomps on one of them. And it was so terrible. And the, the airlines gave up my phone number to this woman who was pretty much like, yeah, don't worry. Does he have his shots? You know, uh, it happens to kids. So and that was the beginning of not trusting the boss with children ever. Um, so anyways, so he is going with me on the road. We finally move into this house. Um, we move into this guest house in Van Nuys and I will tell you, it was probably one of the most haunted places I have ever lived. And there were stories like I used to keep two radios on the side of my bed because I would listen to two different AM talk radio stations. I really like talk radio would listen to art bell at night. And then I would listen to a different one in the morning. And there was at one point there was something scratching from underneath and then on top on the attic of this place, there was one night I woke up, something was being like someone had, was dragging a hammer across the roof. And at one point I had to get up and check and see what was going on. I didn't realize how, um, this place was that haunted that night. And a couple nights after that scratching underneath my bed kept happening. And I remember being half asleep and turning on one of the radios, like, let's just drown that out. And there was this horrible voice coming out of the radio. like rah, 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 rah. So I turned off the radio, turned on the other radio, same voice, two different stations. And I was like, what? And I remember looking at courage and just seeing him with his ears up. Um, and shortly after that, Courage got very sick. And um, I remember one day I was meditating and out of the corner of my eye, I opened my eye, I was meditating, a corner of my eye, I saw like a black mass go by and it was very, um, it almost looked like that despicable me, you know, the character that Steve or uh, yeah. Steve Carell plays and it's got the big back and there's just that pointy nose. 
That's what I saw. And it was very weird because the thing turned its head and looked at me and then disappeared like I wasn't supposed to see it. Now, this was when I was first starting my paranormal investigation. And I was very like, oh, that's fine. Oh, wow. There's a black mass. This is great, which is never great. So courage started getting very, very sick. Um, the vet couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. I remember his back legs weren't working right. Um, he wasn't eating. He would just go under the bed and wait. And so someone said to me, you have to call this animal communicator. Her name is Sonia King. She's also a comedian. So I made an appointment and I was like, I don't know what's wrong. And she said, well, I can only tell you this. I would never just blatantly tell this to another client, but something in that house is scaring him and you need to do a cleanse and you need to do Reiki on him. And I did both those things that she said, and he walked out from under the bed himself, brand new, like nothing wrong with his legs, ready to eat, ready to play. And that was when I sort of got, this is my, this is my paranormal partner. And of course, then this is part of my special, but of course, then Sonia said, do you want me to ask him anything else? And I said, do you ask him why he doesn't like the dog across the street? She pauses for a minute and she said, he keeps telling me about his vest. He keeps telling me he has a job. And he told me that dog doesn't have a job. And I thought, oh, that's how Courage knows. He knows he has a service vest. He knows he has a job. And um, that was when she said, you know, this is the bossiest dog I've ever known. And that's when she named him the boss. So her and I hit it off and had such a good talk and such a good time. So there was the boss connecting me to my um, new best friend. And to this day, my best friend. And she would call me and say, the boss just popped in and he wants you to know this. One day I was talking to her on the phone and she goes, hey, the boss uh, is telling me there used to be triangles in his dish and now there's squares and he doesn't want the squares. And I had just changed his food. And there he was sitting next to the can of food or the, the bowl of food, just like looking at me like, yeah, we're changing. We're not changing this. Um, I remember one time he was so sick and I called her, I said, he won't stop throwing up. And she, she so if you know Sonia, she gets quiet for a minute and then she goes, so he's showing some old Chinese food on the street that he ate because at that point he would just eat anything. And uh, she said, that's what made him sick. And he wants you to know he's going to eat it again. If he has the chance, he's going to eat it again. So he was so funny. Um, he always had a seat. He had a car seat. And, um, if you have a dog and he travels with you, get a car seat or a strap or put him in the back seat. Because one time a friend was driving and, um, his accelerator got stuck. We went straight across the street. My head went through the windshield and courage popped out. But someone said, had there been an airbag, he would have been dead. So get your dog a car seat. So he would have a car seat that was strapped up so he could see outside. And one day I moved it down because I thought it would stop the bumping. And when I moved it down, I'm on the phone with Sonia and she says, Courage wants to know why he's so low. He can't see and he wants to be high again. <laughs> so I had to pull over and fix the car seat. Um, but basically... That was how things have always been. Sometimes Sonia would just call me out of the blue. The boss says he's having a good day. I'll never forget the day she called me and she said, uh, the boss just popped in to tell me he's been very busy. He's been very busy. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but he's very busy. Um, okay, hold on. Let's take a break. I'll be right back. Greetings to all the listeners of Paranormal Karen. This is Ryan Singer stand-up comedian, host of Me and Paranormal You, Paranormal Investigator with our friend Karen, and creator of Crystallize, the photo identification app for crystals. I'm so excited because the app is available for free download on iPhone or Android now, right now. You can look up info on your favorite crystals in our 300 plus crystal guide. You can start your personal collection, keep track of your favorite crystals. You can look up info on ethical sourcing. You can go to our directory and find crystal shops near you and get directions to those shops. Oh boy, all this is free. We also have a premium section. So if you are a premium subscriber, you get unlimited photo identifications and an unlimited personal collection size. Coming soon, we're connecting you with 
ethically sourced vendor so you can feel good about feeling good. Download Crystallize today. So there's just so many stories and so many funny stories about the boss. Um, and so the last two years have been really, really hard medically. Anyone that has an old dog knows, boy, it's if it's not one thing, it's another. And we were constantly putting out fires, but he would always come back. He would always do good. He would slow down a little bit. Um, but you know, even for the last year, his hips would hurt. So I'd wait for him to get up in the morning, which is if you can get a dog that slept in like the boss, that's the best dog ever. And so every morning I'd wait and they'd look in and when he'd sit up, I'd massage his hips for 15 minutes before we'd go out and go to the bathroom, which is, um, it's funny because somebody was like, you know, would you treat a man like that? And I was like, I think so. I don't know if I'd rub his hips for 15 minutes, but I know I would the boss. And it was pretty much thousands and thousands of dollars. And I know even now I have about $2,000 worth of medication in this place because apparently I thought he was going to live forever. I had always said to him, 18 years, I had always said, you're going to go to 18. And since age 13, everyone keeps going. The, the vets were always like, yeah, this is an old dog, like preparing me. And I was like, nope, 18. In fact, even when we left a couple months ago, the cardiologist, because Courage had a cardiologist, he has a psychic, um, he has a vet, he has a, <laughs> a dentist. Um, I think he has a therapist. I don't know. So he, um, he always said I had to take care of his teeth. We had a lot of problems with his teeth and he couldn't be under anesthesia. He had a stroke under anesthesia when he was like four. So that's why one of his eyes didn't work. So the list goes on and on. And I remember one time, uh, he always, every night I would do his teeth and every night he would bite me. And one time I said to Sonia, um, can you tell me if this hurts him? Am I hurting him? And so I brushed his teeth and I said, what did he say? And she goes, wait, I can't tell. There's just rage. <laughs> so that was our thing. Every night he would just, he would just rage. And if you're listening to this somewhere where you're aren't not seeing my Instagram, just look at that little face on the picture and you will know that that was a very determined, nobody's going to tell me what to do dog. And so he would bite me every night. So, um, he's with me for the cross country drive. And now he can barely see and can barely hear. And I only would put him up. I slept, I've always slept on a futon, which was about a foot off the ground. So he knew how to get on and off the foot, futon, although I would ordinarily lift him. If I, I could always feel when he was up and if he removed a little, I would wake up and I would lift him down. If he wanted to go get water, I'd lift him up. And so on the first part of this trip, he jumped off a of bed and hit a hardwood floor I thought that was the end. I called Sonia. Oh my God. What's going on? I had him on the bed. I thought he was asleep and, um, he was okay. He made it. So this whole trip, he would just sit on his little seat and stare at me. And I was like, what is going on? And Sonia was like, he's just cheering for you. He's just giving you a cheerlead. And, um, he stopped really eating anything but chicken, which was, I was like, courage, you got to eat something. You know, I had good stuff that always made his joints feel better. And I had good stuff, the CBD stuff he wouldn't eat. And I was like, is his teeth? What is it? So he became constipated very early on, on this trip, but we made it. And, um, uh, you know, we stayed in all the hotels and everything. We made it here to Utica and, it was so cold and I tried to put out newspaper. He was paper trained, but he told Sonia he didn't like it. He wasn't doing it, but you know, it was so cold and up in the middle of the night, he'd have to go down. You know, I, w I ended up sleeping probably for the past year in hotels. I would sleep with a leash on him so that if he even stepped up, the leash would pull on my hand and I would wake up. He couldn't fall off. He couldn't jump off. That was that one time, of course, that I thought he was asleep and he jumped off the bed, um, blind and deaf. You got to admire that kind of bravery. That's why his name was courage. So when we got here to Utica, it was so cold. Then we had a couple of good days and, um, I really, one night he had a coughing fit for about 20 minutes and I looked in his eyes and I was like, I know, buddy, I know we're getting there. And he was so tired. 
So the next day I called Sonia and I was like, I, I think we're close. And I was supposed to be, I think this was a Monday or a Tuesday. And I, it was a Monday and Wednesday I was get, I'm so far from the airport. I'm so not comedy situated. The Albany airport is 90 minutes away and my flight to Seattle, this is only the second week I'm here. I'm here one weekend and I'm over flying to Seattle. So I had to get a hotel room for that night in Albany, get up at 3 a.m. and go to the airport and then fly to Seattle. Seattle. I was there a day early, then do the show, then fly back, get the car. So this is all just so much stuff. And I'm doing it the weekend after. There's two gigs in Seattle, which were so easy from L.A., but then I didn't realize I was moving to Utica. So um, Monday I talked to Sonia and she's like, yeah, yeah, it's coming. And she said, he says he's going to make it this weekend, but he doesn't think he can make it to the weekend after. So I'm feeling that, but I'm looking at him and he's wobbly and he can barely stand up and it's freezing out and he's not eating anything but chicken. That argument is going on and he's just pooping very little. So Tuesday comes, everything's somewhat okay. So Wednesday comes and I'm going to finish my readings and then go to the airport at six. And about 11 o'clock, he goes outside like he's going to poop and he starts that spinning that dogs do. And he's spinning and he's spinning and he's spinning. And I'm thinking his hips can't hold him. What is going on? And so I bring him in and I try and calm him down. Nothing is coming out. Nothing's coming out. He's still marching all over spinning. And then he throws up all over and he hadn't just eaten. And I was like, something's really wrong. So I call, I cancel all my readings. Um, you know, I'm so used to LA Utica. None of the vets will see him. No, no. 24 hours. We don't do emergency too bad. You're gonna have to go to Syracuse. Syracuse is an hour away. So I finally call Syracuse and I'm like, we're on our way. You know, I, I, this is just a crazy, he can't sit down. I literally have to put him on the floor in the passenger side so he can spin and walk and spin and walk. And I'm holding the leash and I'm trying to drive and it's, I'm freaking out. And there's a voice in my head that says he has a blockage. You have to put him down. So I'm texting Sonia and she's either doing a reading or she's not there. She has her own life. She's not available at that moment. But I hear that and I know it. And so I pull in and um, this place is great. He's still spinning in the parking lot. And so they take him in. So I call Sonia and she says, well, I haven't checked in with him yet, but you know, this could just be constipation. They can give him an enema. And I was like, oh, that's great. Because I said he'd go with me this weekend. And um, see, I might have to pause because I'm going to start crying. So he goes in and they have him in for about an hour. But I'm kind of calm now. I'm kind of thinking maybe this is just constipation and everything's going to be fine. And um, I go to get out of the car. Because it's a nice day. We finally have a nice day. And the sun is out. And right outside of my door... On the ground is a tiny sword that has fallen off someone's necklace. And I pick it up and I'm looking at it. And that's very interesting because who has a sword necklace? You no, know, I'm a tarot reader <laughs> and there's a whole suit of swords. But I own a sword, but this is right there on the ground. So I pick it up and then the phone rings and it's the vet. Because now with COVID, you still can't go in. And she starts to tell me that there's a blockage and she starts to go through the options, which are minimal. And I'm thinking in my head, you know, he's traveled with me everywhere. There's no, there's no, I don't know if this is bad. I had to have a session with my therapist about this because I was like, okay, well, um, should I do it here or should I do it in Seattle? I'm literally thinking I'm going to take him on a plane and, <laughs> I know I have to euthanize him. I'm going to do it here in Seattle because that's our life. 
I was like, I don't, and my sister was like, you can leave him here. And I was like, no, 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 no. He went with me everywhere through everything. I never left him. I left him for two months to go on a cruise ship when I was, um, I think he was six. And I was like, never again. I was like, no cruise ships. I don't leave him. He stayed with my parents. That was fine. Um, once he stayed with a friend for a yoga retreat, but I was like, no, this is my dog and I'm going to be with him. I won't leave the country until he's gone. So she tells me about the blockage and, um, she says, here's kind of the options. And she said, I can give him something for the constipation, but this could be a day. This could not work. You could be on that plane with him having terrible diarrhea and being sick. And she said, and also the biggest worry is that this gets worse and he's in extreme pain by tonight. And she said he spun and spun and spun in there for an hour until he kind of collapsed. So I call Sonia and she says, we're both crying, crying, crying. And she says, he's, he's ready to go. He says, it's okay. So I'm going to pause. Okay. So it takes a while to make that decision, but I'm like, I can't take, I can't take more pain than he was in. And I thought I heard that in my head so clearly it's, it's just time. So I go in and I ask the vet, what would you do? And she goes, I can't even promise you a day and it could be a horrible day. So she says, I would do that. So they put me in a room and they bring him in. And he just falls asleep on my chest like he did the first night I had him. And I start to sing to him. And I sing to him. Um, <laughs> I used to sing to him all the time, you are my sunshine. But instead of sunshine, I would say courage. You are my courage. And I say, if you are ready, can you look up at me? And it was the last time he lifted his head and looked up at me. And he was so peaceful, and so warm, and so sweet. And so we just sat there for an hour. And of course, they were like, take all the time you need. They were just fantastic. And then finally, I called them in. And they had already had the little thing in them you know, where they put the stuff to youth at night in him. And I'm very proud to say that when they put that in, he bit them <laughs> because he was the boss. And right up to the end, he was making sure everybody knew he was the boss. In fact, I remember one time I went to my vet in LA and they were just doing the texts were giving him his fluids. And the vet came out to tell me that she was in her office doing her work. And she heard someone yell, ow, he bit me. And she said, oh, courage is here. So that was the boss right up until the day. So they give him that. And it's so, it's so peaceful. And she, uh, takes his heartbeat and says he's gone. And you just, you hold that little body. And I asked him for a scissor because I wanted some of his fur. And then when the little soul leaves, they don't look like themselves anymore. But I was in there for like a half an hour holding that little beautiful body. And I remember laying him down and just thinking, oh, don't, don't bump his head. Don't bump his head. And 
Then I left. And I drove home. And everything happened perfectly like it should. I just thought, hold it together. When I walked in the house, his little red coat was on the floor. And his beds were all over because he had 10 beds because that's how you treat a boss. And my mind was busy. This was very good. I said, take his stuff out of the suitcase, get ready to go. And all this busy stuff and driving was good. I had to be somewhere. I remember I had a friend that told me that she, uh, when her dog passed, she immediately went to Las Vegas. And I think that was the greatest tip. If you can change anything of your environment when you have to put one of your animals down, please do it. Okay. Go to the hotel room. I'm okay. Get up three in the morning. You know, um, <laughs> I did not realize, first of all, how much he was a 24 hour. It was 24 hours a day with him and in the airplane in the, I will be honest with you. The airlines are terrible. If you have a dog, they are mean. They uh, bully you. They, you know, I just was like, Oh, I just walk in now. I don't have to talk to anyone. I have my boarding pass. I just walk in. And I can't believe he's not under the seat. And we get to Chicago. And I go to get a bagel. And in my head, I hear very clearly, you should get the cream cheese. And I'm like, I'm not getting the cream cheese. Because I'm vegan. I don't eat cream cheese. But wherever there was cream cheese, Courage would get cream cheese. And I hear him very loudly. I want cream cheese. And I start to laugh. And at that point, I can hear him in my head so clear. I can hear what he's saying. I can hear what he's thinking. I can hear him telling me it's okay. And I immediately text Sonia. And she's like, yeah, you can hear him now. You can hear him very clearly. And I bet he's going to help you with animal communication. And I've only done one since this happened. And it was pretty amazing. But this whole trip, I could hear him. And I get to the hotel room and I'm working with a friend of mine, Stephanie Blum. And I had texted her like, Hey, courage passed. I think, I hope I'm going to be okay. But I was kind of like, you know, I don't want to walk in and people know courage. They'll be like, Hey, where's the dog? And I thought, am I going to burst into tears? What's going to happen? And thank God we fly in a day early. And, um, she meets me at the door with the cutest little stuffed animal and says, I didn't want you to miss courage. So I bought this for you. Please do that for anyone that's lost a pet. It was it was the perfect thing at the perfect time. So she comes in and starts talking. And I haven't seen Stephanie in so long. And it turns out we both are painting and doing all these things. And she is so helpful. And then we have the show. And the show is great. And then we fly home. And it starts to really kind of hit me. Um, while I had just instinctively made a, an appointment with my therapist at that time, a zoom appointment for Friday. And so of course I fall apart, you know, talking to my therapist, did I do the right thing? Should I give him another day? All these things. And she was like, I think you did the right thing. And this is what happens when you put them down is you just can't, did he want more hours? Did he want more chicken? What was this? You can't compute. So I tell her about the little sword, which, by the way, I have now lost. I can't find it. And she goes, well, let's look up the spiritual meaning of sword. And, of course, there's the tarot meeting. And she goes, and here it is. And the meaning, spiritual meaning of the word sword is courage. So, of course, we're amazed at that. And then she goes, let me tell you a story about a woman. Because I want, I know courage wants you to be happy, which is exactly what Sonia says. And he doesn't want you to feel bad. And he doesn't want you to worry about all this. So <laughs> she tells me this story about a client she has. And the client has lost her son. 
And she is so distraught and so broken apart that she goes on a, she goes to a foreign country. She goes, I just, I can't. She finally goes on vacation. I don't know if it's Italy or something like that. It's somewhere where they don't speak English. Sorry, I know this is gross, all the sniffling, but it is what it is, right? So she goes to this restaurant and she's eating. And they have wandering musicians. And the musicians are playing table to table. And they come to her table. And they just start playing. You are my sunshine. And she breaks into tears because she knows that that's her son telling her to be happy. And then I told my therapist that I sang that song and she was like, it was just like so many beautiful synchronicities. And she was like, is that a popular song? How is that coming up? And I was like, no, that's the boss. That's how magical the boss is. So I have a great show and I go home and I'm thinking halfway on the drive home, I had to stop at a place and I just had to throw out his little seat. Cause so I was like, I can't look over at that seat and it's empty. So I throw out the seat and I think, Oh, I'm going to be so sad when I open the door and there's his little coat on the floor and his beds are all over and I get home and I can't get in. And so I call the landlady and she says, no, the keys are downstairs. She said, I had had trouble with my door, uh, wouldn't close or something. So they changed all the doorknobs. So the keys were right downstairs. And she said, I wanted you to know when you moved in, it was so fast that we didn't get a good clean of the place. So, um, while you were away, we went in and cleaned it spick and span and I walk in and not only is it so clean, but Courage's little coats have been folded up and put on a table and his beds are not strung all over. They've been folded up and put on the couch. And I don't know why, but that helped me so much. So having a new apartment was actually the greatest thing that could have happened. I know the boss just wanted me to get to Utica. And the last day before he got sick, I said to Sonia, does he want to go to see grandma and grandpa? Cause he's really tired. And she said, no, he wants to go. So he got to see grandma and grandpa the last day. And if this had been LA, it would have been torture because where I walked him, where I, where he slept all the, on the edge of the bed, all of that would have just been torture. But I had a new apartment and a clean slate, and that helped out so much. And the fact that they cleaned this place was just perfect timing. So I'm adjusting, and everything's getting better, and everything's okay. And then this week, I was supposed to go to Seattle again. Um, so I'm taping this in March. And I go through the whole thing. He's not with me. I get to the airport. And Southwest has just canceled my flight. I get there at 3 in the morning. I've already spent all this money, gas, hotel, everything. They're just like, yeah, you're not going to make it. Ugh. So I'm all done. I was a huge Southwest fan. I'm all done. So I'm home this weekend, which is kind of torture. But on Friday morning, they call me, encourages ashes to have come in. So I drive up to pick up his ashes. And as I'm outside waiting, what do I see in the cup holder that I have checked 10 times is the little sword. So I am actually doing way better. I can hear him in my head. He disappeared for a little bit. He shows up enormous in my mind. And Sonya says that's because how that's his energy was. But I just want you guys to know that was such a magical thing and all the synchronicities and I'm really doing okay, but I so appreciate all the emails, text messages and everything. And I hope this episode was okay. Um, it just felt like he was such a part of everything that some of you that maybe have magical animals, this will help you or you've had to put down a magical animal 
know that you can hear them better now. And they're on the other side helping. So thank you very much for listening. And next week we're going to have Sonia King. She's going to talk about this. I have so many great guests coming up. Thank you so much, you guys. And I love you for all the things and great words and text messages you sent me. Okay, everybody. Next week, back to normal. Thanks. Thanks to Mike at Uno Rising Media and all of you guys for making this podcast so special to me.